All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Ashley Bischoff, also with me moderating is Johnny James, and of course our speaker of the day, uh, John Gibbons. Uh, how are you doing, John? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Hi, thanks for having me. Fantastic, my pleasure. Uh, so you were saying that uh, it's already getting dark in your part of the world? <laughs> yeah, so I'm over in the UK, and uh, I was just getting my computer set up and uh, sat myself down in my in my living room and uh, everything started to get dark. <laughs> so I've just gone and got my bedside lamp from upstairs to to make sure you can actually see me. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it started to get dark already, which is a bit strange. We've had a lovely day here until this afternoon. Just started to rain and uh, now it's just really cloudy. Uh, so it's it's like seven o'clock here. Um, but this is this is strange for it to be getting so dark so early. But yeah. Yikes. Well, um, I don't want to uh, keep up any more of your time from your talk, uh, so just to uh, quickly introduce you, um, our speaker is uh, John Gibbons, and he's a technical director at, and accessibility whiz at Dig Inclusion, and he's been working with accessibility stuff since 2003. And with that, it's over to you, John. Hi, thanks. Well, uh, let's see if we can get this uh, this screen share up and running. But I um, just wanted to say thanks to the Pasiello Group for uh, for having me and, and uh, inviting me to talk today. Uh, let's see if we can get screen sharing up and running and see how this goes. Uh, can you guys see the first slide? Okay. Yep, looking good. Hopefully. This is all good. Okay, great. Uh, I'll start. Okay, cool. Well, I hope you guys have been having fun watching ID24 today. I've managed to watch uh, a couple of uh, a couple of the talks, but uh, I've uh, I've been on daddy duty for the day, so I, uh, I haven't been able to see see a lot of it. But I've been seeing lots of uh, things going around on Twitter. So uh, yeah, um, hope you uh, enjoy my talk. Anyway, so I'm I'm going to be uh, talking about accessible UX today and. Uh, going beyond the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And uh, there are some things in the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that, uh, that, that cover kind of uh, user experience and usability kind of uh, things. And uh, I, I wanted to sort of explore beyond what the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and uh, version 2 uh, currently sort of advise uh, based on some of the things that I've seen in um, my testing over the years, um, but uh, also in... Uh, uh, in, in having a play with screen readers and uh, doing a bit of experimentation. Um, you guys, anybody has been um, following my blog, uh, <laughs> I haven't blogged anything in, in many a year, but uh, I, I used to have a lab uh, on my website where I, I used to sort of have test cases for different things that screen readers do and found some interesting things that uh, they, they do sometimes. And uh, uh, that kind of inspired me to do uh, a little bit about that as well. Um, so some of the stuff that we see on websites that when we're testing, some of the things that screen readers say um, can be quite funny sometimes. When they can, uh, it, it's not always apparent from somebody for somebody who is building a website, um, even following the web content accessibility guidelines, to know exactly how what they're doing uh, affects the end user experience. That only comes with having experience yourself. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So accessible UX, let's uh, do a bit of an introduction around uh, what is accessible UX and, uh, and where web content accessibility guidelines meets UX and then we'll, we'll go a bit beyond and, and, and see what else is, uh, is happening uh, outside of the, content, uh, the guidelines. So, oh, my, my slide's gone off the right hand side a little bit, but um, accessibility cannot be done by one person alone in your team. Um, this is uh, one of the problems with, uh, with with UX at the moment is that uh, you may have an accessibility champion in this, in your team. It's fantastic that that, that happens, um, but don't just be the accessibility guy or gal. Raise awareness because it, it's it's not the responsibility of one person to be implementing accessibility. It's uh, it, it, it's more than that. And uh, hopefully we're 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 watching today because we want to uh, make a commitment to uh, making accessible websites and. Uh, 
so by raising awareness and teaching others and, and continuing to learn for yourself as well, um, you're, you're helping to, to ingrain accessibility into your process, uh, which is uh, partly uh, another problem that um, the QA stage and testing phase of uh, uh, projects usually comes too late for accessibility concerns. I'm currently doing some work with a client where um, they've not done some things early enough, so what's happened is they've ended up with a UI that is reliant on some data from the back end, and the data back on the back end is uh, being used to inform some of the UI, and they're, in, they're, they're intertwined. So when something goes wrong uh, that doesn't quite work on the, on the front end, it's not as simple as just making the change on the front end. It's not always as simple as that. Sometimes it has impact on, on other systems or the system as a whole uh, when you're talking about web applications. And if they thought about accessibility a little earlier on, then they could have uh, avoided this problem rather than having to uh, ship their product with, uh, with a, a, a known issue. So thinking about accessibility as early as possible and baking it into your process is, is, is another problem that, or is an, another thing that we really need to start, to start trying to do to improve accessibility on, on the web. So a third problem is, well, as, as I mentioned, that uh, accessibility isn't, uh, isn't built into the development process. So what, what can you do? Uh, so there's a standard in the UK uh, called uh, the S8878, uh, and uh, this is not a set of development guidelines. Uh, it's it's, uh, it, it's a, a roadmap for ensuring that pro uh, web products, that and websites and apps are built in an accessible way, and uh, it gives you some pointers for uh, for implementing accessibility as part of your process. Okay. So this is this is controversial. Uh, I uh, I don't I don't have all the answers. Uh, you, you, my clients may may come to me and, and pay me to to have the answers, but the fact is that accessibility is uh, contextual to your project, and uh, there's no better person to implement accessibility in your product than than you, or or, or no better people than your team. Um, so. Accessibility comes with experience. You do need to uh, have gotten experience of accessibility and, and implementing accessibility and knowing how things work to uh, to be able to uh, to implement it fully. Um, but accessibility is not just about code. There are uh, things beyond code that we uh, uh, we that come into play. So, just because you add something that is accessible to a website, it doesn't mean that it will make sense. This is a photo I've taken from a train uh, here in the UK, and for those who can't see it, there is a uh, some buttons for going in and out of uh, a toilet or a restroom, and um, the the sign next to these uh, these buttons have braille on the, on, on the signs. And uh, actually, the, the labels for the buttons themselves, which have arrows pointing down, have Braille on them as well. One of the things here that there's a light that says the door is locked. So the information telling you the, the state of the door, if you like, is a light. So they've thought about accessibility and added the, uh, the Braille, but they haven't thought about how you're going to uh, tell users that uh, the door is locked or which button to current to press. And even the position of the labeling isn't great because somebody who's uh, reliant on, on, uh, on Braille or who's reading the, the, the Braille uh, label can't figure out easily which button the label is labeling. Uh, so just the, uh, the, the point that it's not always as straightforward as, as making it something, adding some accessible code, for example, to a, a website. And hopefully, this uh, helps drive home the point that design, the design stage is important for establishing the context and making sense of the answers before they become problems. So there's a little bit of a delay between me pressing for the next slide and the next slide coming up. So hopefully, hopefully this is not causing too much of a problem for people who are watching. So. 
the UX process, this is kind of a, a rough definition of uh, uh, the user experience design process. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how to incorporate accessibility at different, different stages. Um, so just to give you a summary, a bit, you might re do some research, find out some information about your users and what, what kind of uh, things your competitors are doing for your product or website and, all, and that kind of thing. And uh, define, define some, uh, some goals for, for the project and uh, define some different, uh, like you might do some information architecture work, that kind of thing, leading on to some wireframing um, and iterative testing with real people. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to go through each of these steps uh, of the process and talk about how you can incorporate accessibility into those different stages. So think about accessibility early, as we've said. Um, the very fact that you're thinking about uh, accessibility, thinking about people, uh, is at, the, at an early stage when you're thinking of a, a, UX, a typical modern UX process and a user-centered design approach. Um, accessibility is far more likely to get baked into your prototypes and persist through development, not get lost on the way, and then make it into production at an acceptable level. So putting people first goes a long way towards accessibility. And include people with, uh, with disabilities uh, for diverse personas in your in early stages of design. Uh, people with different disabilities, different needs, older people, um, and plan to test with similar people later on down the line as, as you're, you're developing your, your product. Um, there's uh, some resources around this on the w, uh, W3C's website, and uh, there's some recent videos that's been, that have been put up uh, that's well worth looking at, and uh, AbilityNet have some uh, some examples of personas that they use on their website, so if you're looking for information on that, go, go check those resources out. So defining things, building a, uh, uh, an information architecture, um, plan understandable structure and plan your heading structure in advance. Um, I've got some, some slides in a moment that sort of show this in, in works. Uh, I'll post some links later on on, on, on Twitter when I've, I've finished to some of these resources I'm talking about. And I have some links at the end of the talk, by the way, um, to some of these resources. Uh, somebody just asked, this, asked a question around that, so I'd, I'd say that now. So what kind of things do we tend to define? What kind of things do we, uh, would help with accessibility? Hopefully the slide's going to go. Slide's going to move, or not. OK, here we go. It's gone forward a few slides. Sorry, it's just catching up with me. OK, labeling. We know from the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, if we've uh, used them before, that concise, we, it requires concise, clear, um, uh, consistent and descriptive uh, labels for things. Um, and that, that goes for form controls, for your navigation items, um, and uh, for, for link text in general. But these things help everybody, not just uh, people with disabilities. Design with accessibility in mind. So multimodal interactions. Um, these kind of things I think of uh, as if you're building something that has a hover uh, behavior on the website, then think about how somebody might interact with that using the keyboard and using focus uh, events or focus styles. Um, also things around different uh, multimedia interactions. So if somebody can't see a video, how are they going to access the content? And, and think about like transcripts and audio description, those kind of things. And how are those things going to get built into your media player, for example? And, and, uh, and, and think about those things early. Familiarity goes a long way in, in UX, but it also goes a long way to, towards uh, accessibility and helping people to understand content, but also understand where they are, orientation within a website, 
and uh, how to get to where they're wanting to go. And layout and content order is always important. Uh, the content order has particular, uh, uh, well, layout and content order have particular uh, impact on somebody who's using the keyboard or somebody who is reliant on a screen reader. Again, from the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, contrast and having 4.5 to 1 at least uh, in the uh, WCAG AA standards. Um, when you're designing your color schemes, um, do your proposed primary colors, uh, when you're using them for, for, for your, your content and for your, for your text, is it, are the color combinations going to work? Um, we've come up against, a, in, in, our, in our work, a couple of clients who have brand colors that don't quite work. Uh, for white text on green or white text on blue uh, just because of the certain hints and, or tints that are being used. So have a think about those things early. How are those things going to impact the design? And a higher contrast ratio for mobile is, is required. So uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Color combinations, helping people who have color blindness uh, issues to access content. What kind of things are, do we need to look at there? and uh, not using color as the only means to convey information on a page. We know these things from the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. WebAIM have a fantastic resource uh, for designers on uh, the pull, pull together all the things to, co to consider when designing um, your uh, websites or applications. So be sure to go and take a look at that. So wireframing, wireframe with accessibility in mind. You can fix accessibility before your, your product even hits screens. For example, content order. Documenting accessibility as you go uh, will, will help with your future iterations. So make that part of your standard practice. Annotate your wireframes with accessibility details. You're probably doing some of this already but you can do things like particularly highlight the structure of a page to help understand what kind of semantics might be in there. Um, and adding headings at appropriate places really helps people with cognitive dis uh, disabilities, um, but also people who are using a screen reader for aiding navigation. So how can we do this? Here's just a couple of examples that are mocked up. This is a, an iPhone app that has, say, a, a news uh, area on it. And uh, you, you can label the content order and define the primary areas of different of, of the screen. And if this was a web page, you'd be thinking about where you'd be putting your nav element or your main element or your header element for the page. On the right, we have another uh, mock-up, a sketch of a, a news page. What, where are the headings going to be? What might the page title or the screen title be? Those kind of things are important. You can even go to the extent of, if you have imagery on the page, how is that going to get conveyed to assistive technology users? So this thing that we're getting used to uh, for uh, responsive websites or even apps, the hamburger menu, how is that going to get conveyed to, to people with, uh, with disabilities? So when you get to testing, what can you do? So make sure you incorporate people with disabilities in your wireframe and design reviews. If you have a prototype, make sure that you test with, with people that have disabilities. If you, as I said earlier, if you've added people with disabilities into your set of personas, you'll be doing this anyway, hopefully. And when you're doing practical user testing, what kind of things might a person with a disability um, require out of the physical premises where you're doing user testing? Is remote testing possible? Um, be prepared for certain for the test sessions to take longer than than, than usual. Um, as if somebody finds a, a, an issue with with your site, it might take longer for them to to find a solution. It might take longer for them to understand the content. 
is the lab itself that you, if you're having a physical premises for your tests, is that accessible? So, we've already talked a little bit about whether web content accessibility guidelines can help in the UX process, but what specific things are there? I'm not going to dwell too long on these slides because these are kind of things that you might have seen before or other people today have been talking about, but there are things that you can, there are plenty of uh, articles out there on the web that you can go and take a look at to find out more about this. So, information and relationships are part of the Web Content Accessibility Guideline. Sometimes adding semantics is just not enough. For example, did you know that adding the M tag or strong tag doesn't necessarily get pronounced differently to other body text in screen readers? It's not by default anyway. You can interrogate the, you know, find out more about a particular element and find out whether it's got a strong emphasis or not. But a screen reader talking normally will not put additional emphasis on something that has an emphasis or a strong emphasis tag. So you can't rely on them for ex very important information. That's not to say you should not use them. It's just that if you're using them to, say, highlight a piece of text or a paragraph or a short piece of text, would that be better as a heading? Could it be supplemented with some icon iconography that you could put an alternative text on to provide context to that information? Those kind of things you don't know unless you use a screen reader or understand what kind of uh, barriers people with disabilities face. Use of structure helps with context, as I just said. An overview of the page, so if you're adding headings, you can give somebody who's using a screen reader an idea of all the content that's on the page just by having the list of headings and to quickly navigate to the area of the, the, the page that they're interested in. It also helps to break up content so it is more digestible, digestible for everybody to understand and read, or even understand. <laughs> markup. What kind of markup do we add? We add headings. We had add landmarks to a, a screen or a page. Um, the use of lists is helpful. Moving on, web content accessibility guidelines mentions having a, a specifying the language for the page or specifying where uh, language changes. And uh, oddly, this is such a simple thing to add, but it's oddly something that is, is quite often missing from web pages. So what kind of things happen if you don't add this? So say you have sur le pont Avignon. What happens if a screen reader uh, tries to read that in English? You probably end up with sur le, well, le pont Davin non, uh, you know, the, the, it doesn't quite have the same ring to it. It doesn't quite have the same je ne sais quoi. So what happens if we add the French language tag to it? It will say that it was the speech engine in the screen reader will switch to French mode and it will know how to pronounce those words, hopefully. It doesn't always get things right. But think, words like cliche are quite interesting if you don't have the correct, apost uh, the correct accent on the E, or if you um, don't specify the language, you'll end up with klitsch or something, something like that, or something very akin to quiche uh, sometimes gets announced. So those kind of things can be really important for um, helping with understanding the content, because something that's quite quiche doesn't really make sense. Something that's quite cliche does. So moving on again. Instruction and orientation, informative label text, informative heading text, not just the fact that we have labels and have headings, but does the text make sense? And informative error messages. So often error messages get left to, towards when you actually end up implementing something, and the error message 5, 6, 9, 7, uh, something went wrong, doesn't help users. So think about your users early on and what kind of errors might they, might they run into and what's a human readable and understandable way to convey what's going on and what to do about it. Images of text. Well, we know about alternative text. Images of text are just not flexible. But why is it a problem? So the text in the images cannot be selected. 
and you cannot use this text with speech selection functions. For example, on, on iOS, um, a friend of mine is a dyslexic, and he will select a, a, a phrase or a word that he's not quite sure about and have, have iOS voiceover speak just that bit to him. He is a screen reader user but he is, is sighted and wants to understand it, this text, and it's just easier for him to understand it through the audio than it is through reading it. So that can't be done with an image. And the content itself. There are AAA uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines uh, success criteria that cover um, the reading level and, uh, and uh, the content. But very often we're, we're looking at uh, AA uh, when we're, we're building websites as a, as, a, as a good target. But let's not forget about the AAA requirements. Use of plain language wherever possible, un unnecessary use of jargon and slang, the line length, um, justified text, um, all these things I struggle with. Um, I don't have dyslexia or any other kind of disability of that type. But I find that, that when somebody has thought about the, the reading level and thought about how to make their point in plain English, it really helps me understand the content. So let's look a bit beyond the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, I, uh, hopefully, I haven't missed something that's actually part of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines in going through these things. This is a brand new talk. So uh, hopefully I, I won't embarrass myself, but let's see what happens. So when we're thinking about design, sans serif fonts can be, uh, it's much easier in, in body text for people who are dyslexic to, uh, to read, for example. It doesn't mean you can't use serif fonts in different places. It's just that they, they do tend to be easier for people to, to read. If you do insist on having serif fonts as body text, then offer users a way to override that. And in fact, very often, dyslexic users will automatically set their own uh, font that they want to use for, for a website. So be aware that if you're using something like icon fonts, um, that those will get overridden for people who are, who are dyslexic. I learned that on, on Monday from London Web Standards, uh, something I hadn't thought about before. And uh, it's an important point to, to, to make. That supplementing content with imagery and iconography can really help some users. Don't overdo it because it can be uh, distracting. But where appropriate, adding iconography to things like, like the menu system um, can be really helpful for signposting for people who have learning difficulties, for example, or even people who are reading content in a second language. But the way content accessibility guidelines don't really cover this. So what else can we look at? So the web content accessibility guidelines can mostly be applied to mobile applications. At the moment, it's a little bit missing some things. It wasn't really, it wasn't written when uh, touchscreen devices with touchscreen devices in mind. Um, but to be completely fair to the W3C, the, the mobile accessibility task force are on it, and they're making uh, changes, and that you can check out some of the working drafts that are, uh, uh, that are out there and see what kind of things are going to be in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines soon. And uh, there was a talk earlier as well about that, so make sure you check that out on ID24 when, uh, when you're looking back over the videos. But when designing for touch, make sure that the size of navigation items are at least seven millimeters. Now, I say seven millimeters because different screens have different screen resolutions, so it's the the ability for your the end of your fingertip to hit the item that you're wanting to hit on the screen. If you remember when the iPhone first came out, that websites that weren't built to be responsive and you would end up with a, a navigation that you'd have to use pinch zoom, incidentally, an assistive technology that's suddenly become useful to everybody. This is one of the reasons I love mobile. There's so many parallels. But you have to zoom in, and you would still sometimes mash your finger on the wrong link and end up somewhere you didn't want to go to. And uh, these things need to be kept in mind. Now, when, when building applications, don't use really small buttons. And to be fair, most apps and uh, the most responsive websites are already aware of this. Um, 
but it's a, it's an important thing to remember, and it's not actually a requirement yet under the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Reachability, being able to reach up to the top of your screen with your primary jabber, your your thumb, um, that can have a, 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 an, a, it can be an issue for some people. So, Zoom tools, we we experience this all the time, everybody. Um, with a website where you're trying to fill in on your smartphone, it doesn't happen so much, of course, on tablet devices, but if you're trying to fill in on a smartphone and you tap in a, a field and it zooms up to, the, to show you the field and have the, key, the software keyboard appear, if the label is off to the left, you won't necessarily be able to see what you're filling in. If the label's above the, what you're, you're filling in, great. It's so much more e easier for people to read. Actually, it helps... Uh, in general, for uh, like on 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 websites uh, as you're normally browsing, to make the connection, you don't have to have this big bit of white space between uh, the, what you're filling out and, and and the label for it. Just makes sense. But again, that positioning isn't quite ad advised in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So, a higher contrast ratio. Uh, to what's specified in uh, level AA of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And if you're using your mobile phone out and about, and you you might have glare from, from being just out in the sun, and uh, it's not as easy to, to see what's on the screen, so actually having a higher contrast ratio can really help with that. Of course, we can move our phone to be able to get a better view of what's, what's happening. But uh, the BBC guidelines suggest that the AAA requirement of 7 to 1 is more, more appropriate for, for mobile. Now, whether or not that's actually feasible for, uh, for designs on, on mobile for, for designers to implement is another question. But uh, it's, uh, it's important to, to test whether your, your, your design is actually usable out on mobile devices in, in the practical environment that they're going to be used in. So, content itself. We've already talked a bit about content and what kind of things that you can do to make things more accessible, but good accessibility very often begins with the content. So, I've decided that I'm not going to go through a talk without including a picture of some uh, classic rock or metal band somewhere. And KISS says it all. And is there a, a, a place where KISS does not apply? Keep it simple, stupid. Simplicity is a good place to start when you're, uh, when you're, you're looking at, at making something accessible in general, but also in, in terms of your content. Um, I'm quite guilty of brain dumping for, a, uh, for a, a blog post and then having to come back and strip out everything that's unnecessary, boil it right down to the main points, and then then post it up on the web. Not that I do that a lot on my own site at the moment, if anybody's ever been looking at .j.co.uk lately. But um, your writing style, what kind of things can you do? So make your point clear first, and then explain it. By front-loading your paragraphs with the, the, the main point, you can help people who are, are, have dementia, for example. Um, helping people who are uh, having to navigate through a large amount of text to be able to find the bit of the information they're looking for. Somebody using a screen reader, for example. Or somebody who's reading as, uh, with English as a second language. Something that a lot of people don't realize is that somebody who is deaf will, uh, will potentially have English as their second language. Sign language is actually their first language. So understanding the content is actually harder uh, for somebody who is deaf. Try to make one point per paragraph. Again, this is about chunking down the information and uh, making it digestible. Using short line lengths, we kind of touched on this earlier, um, but uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, I think AAA suggests a length of something around 80 characters. Um, I've seen elsewhere uh, recommendations of somewhere around 7 to 10 uh, words per line. and uh, so it's worth thinking about that. Don't keep them too uh, short, for example. But uh, 
because it makes them harder to, to read a, 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 in a style like, a, 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 say, a, in a, a newspaper, that kind of thing. Um, there's also some useful information around uh, that is actually on the W3C website on uh, COGA, uh, uh, who are the uh, Cognitive and uh, Learning Disabilities Task Force, Accessibility Task Force. And they've got a working draft of uh, information around writing style and, uh, and what can help. So that's a good resource to go and check out. Caps. Um, it's long been said that by typing in caps, you make screen readers shout at people. And uh, apparently it still does happen sometimes, but it does cause other issues as well. So writing in all caps can be much harder for people who, 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 with dyslexia to read the content. Um, we actually analyze uh, the shape of words, and by having all caps, you lose that additional sense of the word and to, to be able to aid with reading the, the words. So caps, it, it makes content harder for people with dyslexia to read. But also, it does have an impact on how screen readers, for example, pronounce things. So words like NASA, if you make it uh, uh, capitalized, then it may say N-A-S-A -A rather than NASA, which we don't really refer to NASA as N-A-S-A. -A. Um, perhaps you do. But this, uh, this isn't a major problem, but it's worth bearing in mind that the capitalization of your words can have an impact on how screen readers pronounce things, which brings me to some of the fun here that side of things with content and testing with accessibility tools. I won't tell you what some of the uh, phrasing and pronunciations I've heard over the time because they're not suitable for, uh, for, for all times of day. Um, uh, so uh, be sure to go and take a look at, at online, see what, what kind of thing, or try, try things out for yourself and see what happens. But well, using semantic markup helps and goes a long way to, to, to helping uh, make sure that things are uh, announced in the way that it's expected. Um, screen readers can still get things wrong just by uh, how it uh, analyzes the word or the phrase to, uh, to pronounce it. We have language selection uh, requirements as part of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, but what about that, uh, that pronunciation? So, I have some uh, example, just one example here, and actually I, it's, it's a mobile example, and it, to show you how the differences between iOS, Android, and Windows Mobile, so uh, voiceover, talkback, and I guess you can call it narrator on Windows Mobile, um, says the word e-newsletter, and I've used the hyphenated version of e-newsletter and non-hyphenated, and on iOS, for example, the, uh, the e-newsletter without a hyphen actually sounds quite Russian and says in yours letter. And, uh, but if you put the hyphen in, or put the dash in, it is pronounced as you would expect, e-newsletter. Android does something a little bit different. It says e-newsletter if you use all one word. But it says it correctly if you use a, a hyphen in it. Windows Mobile is actually pretty good and says the correct thing either way. But I'm making a point that uh, compound words um, do cause problems sometimes for screen readers, and this is not required as part of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Compound words are commonplace. We use them day to day. We have, I don't know, on the web, we have bookmark, or, uh, well, we have that in, <laughs> in, in reading books in real life, um, website, that kind of thing. In real life, we, we grandfather or newspaper and weekend, you know, they're all uh, similar, uh, all compound words. But like homepage will pr get pronounced in some cases as homepage, and sitemap as sitemip. Sign up in I uh, voice over iOS sometimes gets pronounced as signup. So spaces and hyphens are important. Just been informed I'm running low on time, so I'm going to sort of run through just a few more slides, and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll come to some questions. But. The word reading and is, gets pronounced as either reading or reading, depending on whether you capitalize the R or whether it's part of a heading sometimes. Um, so the context causes the problem. You may have heard this one before. If you, the emphasis is sometimes in, incorrect. So the pronunciation of skip to content versus skip to main content uh, does make a, a huge difference, but that's why you see skip to main content sometimes. Ambiguity around dates sometimes. Here's a couple of things that happen. So 
0103 could be the 1st of March or the 3rd of January, depending on whether you're in America or not. How does a screen reader work that out? Is the language specified correct? Um, I've seen the number 2013 in a date being pronounced by voiceover on iOS as 2013 inches. Who knows why? Um, or MM in a date format being pronounced as millimeters. Phone numbers are equally something that um, don't always get read out correctly, or company numbers. But there are things that you can do um, to, to improve on it. There's CSS3 has speak as property. Or there's also, uh, you can add span uh, elements to try and break up the, the numbers so they're read correctly. Anyway, moving forward, more testing to be done in this area, but I've got some pronunciation tests on my website. But whose responsibility is it? Is it users, software vendors, developers, content creators, web standards? It's actually all of our uh, responsibility to, uh, to implement accessibility. And just some final thoughts. Test, test, test. The word no, the one sentence, one word sentence, is read by voiceover on iPad correctly. No. On iPhone, it reads it as number. Go figure. But you wouldn't know that unless you test. Um, all these changes, I hope I've, uh, I've, I've helped you to uh, realize, um, are, uh, help everybody. So I'm going to miss off my few, last few slides, but basically I, was, I wanted to talk about uh, empathy. Uh, most of us have a connection to accessibility somewhere, and if you uh, think that you don't, um, just the fact that you might have a mobile phone, as I, as I mentioned through the talk, you might have a, a relationship to, uh, to accessibility uh, that you, you didn't realize you had. Um, most of us are aging. I, I, I would hope all of us are aging. Um, so it does impact our life. And accessibility is about understanding people and the barriers that they, fa they face. So getting your own experience of accessibility helps you uh, to put yourself in the shoes of others and keep accessibility in mind when you're building and testing your websites. So um, one last, final point is uh, if you're going to do accessibility, commit. Um, establish an ongoing commitment to accessibility. Create an accessibility statement and get an accessibility champion on your team. Um, the remaining of my slides are, are just uh, uh, resources, really, so uh, I'll make sure that you can download them towards the end, and uh, 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 at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll upload them, and you can check those out for yourself. So um, I'm going to hand back to uh, Ashley, and uh, as soon as I figure out how, and we'll take some questions. That was great, John. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we've got a couple yeah. of questions from the audience. And just as a reminder to the audience, if you have uh, questions for John, you can tweet those to the ID24 hashtag, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, so uh, just uh, the first one here, um, do you have any thoughts on whether it's more appropriate to use unordered visit versus ordered lists for navigation lists? Um, one of the differences um, in some screen readers versus others is that uh, an ordered list will tell you how many items are in the list as you're going through it. Um, sometimes an unordered list it will too. It will too. Um, but uh, I tend to use unordered lists for for uh, for navigation. Um, that's the, the the fact that you're using a list is it's helpful to use it's to know that there are uh, you're on one of ten. Uh, uh, ten list items. Um, as I say, it doesn't. Uh, I don't think it works in all screen readers. But uh, I think that an ordered list doesn't make sense for navigation because what order is it in? So semantically speaking, it doesn't really make sense. So I I, I use UL rather than OL, um, despite the fact that I'm not. I don't think it pronounces uh, it announces how many items there are in every screen reader. Okay, great. Um, and our, our next question. Um, do you have any rules of thumb about which acronyms screen readers will read letter by letter and which will be pronounced as words? Um, well, NASA is a, a, a one I've seen. Uh, I'm trying to think of others. I, I, I actually found some in my testing of uh, way back. Uh, we tested acronym versus ABBR tags, 
and uh, some they, it, in most screen readers at the time it didn't have an impact on whether something was pronounced as a word so a, a, an acronym or, or something was read out um, letter by letter but in adding that semantics you could at least have a hook for your CSS where you could put uh, how something is supposed to be read using CSS3 speech module and hopefully in the future there would be better support for that uh, for CSS3 and it will make a difference but as far as I'm aware I haven't done any testing recently on it it won't have much of an impact um, screen reader speed or the speech engine that screen reader is using will be responsible for figuring out how to pronounce something so uh, yeah I, I can't think of others off the top of my head but it's it's all down to the testing Okay, and uh, our next question, um, can you talk a bit about um, the support level for the CSS3 speech um, in, in assistive technologies, whether it's non-zero or is there anything to, any news there? Sure, I can. I, I did some research uh, quite some time ago, and again, the, the results were on my, on my uh, lab, but uh, at the time, and this was this is going back some time. Uh, the, the 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 support was practically zero. However, having said that, I know that there uh, support coming for um, like EPUBs. Uh, you can uh, to CSS3 in EPUBs and have say VoiceOver on iOS uh, uh, take take heed of that. And I know that VoiceOver has some level of support for speci specifically speak as I think it is. As I said, I haven't done testing with it recently, so I'm not entirely sure um, what the current levels of support are. But at the time when I did the testing, it was practically zero. So the uh, it was a chicken or egg situation. Is you know, I think it's important to uh, follow standards and to implement these things if uh, if there uh, if the tools are there to use them. Um, whether or not they have support, and the fact that things something something like a an acronym versus a BBR tag, and adding CSS for those two things, so they say that what should be the correct thing. Um, it's it's an addition of say six lines of code to a, a CSS file. So why not do it? Um, it's not a, a lot of extra work. So I, I my advice is to is to use those properties um, as you see fit to. Um, but in testing, you may well see that it makes no difference whatsoever, unfortunately. Good to know. Um, we also have a question from the audience who is asking whether there may be a link to your slides, if those might be online by chance. Yes, there are, will be. I actually did this talk on, on Monday for the first time at London Web Standards. And uh, so there is a version of this, this talk up online already at SlideShare. I hope you find my username on SlideShare. Um, it's my most recent talk. But I'll up upload the slides from this one as well, because I've, I've updated a, a bit with, with some additional bits that I've uh, found over the last few days. So I'll, I'll upload them again to SlideShare, and I'll tweet them. Find me on Twitter as .j, and uh, I'm sure ID24 will retweet them. But yeah, the slides will be available after. Great. And I think we may have time for one more question. Um, they ask, uh, what process do you recommend for ensuring that touch targets are large enough that is larger than the seven millimeters? Um, does it come down to using a ruler on one screen, or do you recommend making those millimeter measurements in the design stage? You can uh, figure out what kind of pixel, depending on what pixel density you're using on, say, on an Android device, depending on the uh, uh, the, the issue with Android being there's so many different screen resolutions to use. Um, with iOS, it's a little bit easier to, to sort out. You can figure out how many, uh, how, how many people should be in uh, the uh, Apple iOS, uh, or Apple uh, human interface guidelines suggest uh, 44 pixels. Um, so, you know, if you're talking in pixels, it's easy to, to, to put that um, into, in, into, uh, in, into practice. Um, but uh, I, yeah, figuring out what's correct for your your particular screen resolution you're you're currently designing for. Um, I would not necessarily get out a ruler and make sure that it's exactly seven millimeters, but um, just test it. And can you actually tap everything uh, with your finger? Um, another uh, consideration is that somebody may be using a touchscreen device but not using their finger. 
somebody made, I know there's some people that, um, that ha um, were affected by thalidomide, uh, have some growth of limbs, um, they may be interacting with an iPad using a, a stick um, held by their toes. Uh, you know, those kind of things, uh, it, the accuracy with which you need to hit things uh, becomes in there. So is there an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to increase or decrease the size of, of those targets? Um, not so, so easy to do in an app, but perhaps in a web page that's possible. But bear in mind that it's not always just about whether you can match it with your finger, but um, actually can, the, the bigger the target, the better um, as far as your design uh, or layout will accommodate without it looking really strange. But uh, you know, really small things do affect some people with different disabilities. So just avoid really small <laughs> my advice. Great. Well, well, thank you so much, John, for your talk and for sticking around to answer questions. Um, I, I thought that was wonderful. Um, I think I might just pass it over no to worries. to Johnny to uh, offer a quick promotion about what's coming up next for ID24. All right. Thanks a lot, John. That was excellent. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Great. Thanks. Uh, so up next, we have the Viking and the Lumberjack. For an hour, they're going to be... Uh, they're going to be interviewing uh, Judy Brewer from W3C, so uh, stay tuned for that in about 10 minutes. And uh, yeah, keep tweeting, uh, hashtag ID24, and we will see you soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Great. Thanks for joining us.